Welcome to the 13th video in this series in which we'll tackle an important issue that we've called Aboriginal Perspectives. The United Nations Report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, with the title Our Common Future, was published in 1987 and is frequently cited to offer useful perspective on sustainability planning. It points to the need to protect the environment against problems of deterioration and depletion, and to base understanding of environmental processes and development on traditional beliefs. The report talks of a method of preserving nature using the traditional ecological knowledge from the original occupants of an area. And increasingly, Western science is beginning to appreciate how indigenous wisdom can be used to enhance our knowledge. So how do we begin to understand those traditional beliefs? First, I'm going to read a passage from a book titled The Sacred Tree, published some 20 years ago in Lethbridge, Alberta. It refers to teachings from elders across Turtle Island. That's North America. So here's the story of the sacred tree. For all the people of the earth, the Creator has planted a sacred tree under which they may gather and there find healing, power, wisdom and security. The roots of this tree spread deep into the body of Mother Earth. Its branches reach upward like hands, praying to Father Sky. The fruits of the tree are the good things the Creator has given to the people, with teachings that show the path to love, compassion, wisdom, justice, courage, respect, humility, and many other wonderful gifts. The ancient ones taught us that the life of the tree is the life of the people. If the people wander far away from the protective shadow of the tree, if they should turn against the tree and attempt to destroy it, great sorrow will fall upon the people. The people will lose their power. They will cease to dream and see visions. They will begin to quarrel among themselves over worthless trifles. They will become unable to tell the truth and to deal with each other honestly. They will forget how to survive in their own land. Their lives will become filled with anger and gloom. Little by little, they will poison themselves on all they touch. It was foretold that these things would come to pass, but the tree would never die. And as long as the tree lives, the people live. It was foretold that the day would come when the people would awaken, as if from a long drugged sleep. They would begin timidly at first, but then with great urgency to search again for the sacred tree. The knowledge of its whereabouts and of the fruits that adorn its branches have always been carefully guarded and preserved within the minds and hearts of our wise elders and leaders. These humble, loving and dedicated souls will guide anyone who is honestly and sincerely seeking along the path leading to the protecting shadow of the sacred tree. Now that story is obviously rich in symbolism and connection to the natural world. And it also reflects a way to express perceptions and experiences through storytelling. The spoken language of art, math and philosophy for Aboriginal peoples. The First Nation people of North America, or Turtle Island, have maintained a cultural concept of the seven generation belief or principle, which is based on an ancient Iroquois philosophy that the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. This concept is also reflected in the UN's Our Common Future report. In recent times, this concept has been threatened due to the sensitivities and vulnerabilities of our younger Aboriginal generations. It's felt important by many that this knowledge be kept alive and instilled or it could vanish from Aboriginal consciousness and understanding. The traditional ecological knowledge being regained and relearned today will hopefully benefit future generations. Now, not surprisingly, similar ideas and concepts can be found in traditions of Aboriginal peoples around the world. The Australian Aborigines, for example, believe that their world was created in the dream time by their ancestors, some of whom still live within secret areas of the land. The Nungabara people, who originate from the central desert of Australia, think of themselves as joined with the natural world. For the Nungabara, each plant, animal, rock and landform has its own consciousness, and its meaning must be understood in its own distinct way. They believe that it is their responsibility to maintain these life memories by storytelling, ceremonies and dancing. If memories are not maintained, the animals and ancestors dwindle away. For instance, 
If the emu were to become endangered, then it is incumbent upon the family clan whose totem is the emu to make it right. Otherwise, they could be blamed. So this responsibility is taken very seriously. If not corrected with ceremonies and actions, the whole emu totem clan could disappear due to the interconnectedness of all things, which could in turn endanger the whole clan. The Nungabara tell stories to the coming generations of the rules of a place, such as where and how areas are to be or not to be protected from hunting and other usage. If a couple of trees were dropped into a river, it was done to provide a sanctuary for small fish and crustaceans, which in turn enticed the larger fish and crustaceans to hunt in the river, providing a sustainable source of sustenance. For the Nungabara people, respect was a traditional value taught at an early age began with the general respect for all life and all societies. This traditional ecological knowledge offers a more holistic view to sustainability and to the environment. Currently, this big picture approach appears to be too costly or complex to be applied by companies interested in ecological accountability. Traditional methods are felt only to provide a limited snapshot of the state of a system. So what can we do? Take a simple situation. If we aren't feeling well, we usually have a sense of what it might be. We learn to understand our own bodies. Maybe it was something we ate or drank. Maybe we didn't get enough sleep. And maybe it's a past injury acting up again. Our body tells us something is not going well. We recognize the signs or symptoms and take appropriate action, perhaps some medicine. In a way, this is a kind of middle ground between Aboriginal knowledge and traditional methods and science, something we call bioindicators, and something of a increasing relevance today. Perhaps a, an early bioindicator were those mining canaries, which were used to detect the presence of toxic gases in mines. Today, these have been replaced by chemical and electronic detectors, fortunately for the canaries. Bioindicator is an umbrella term that covers any biological process, species, or community that can be used to determine the health of an environment. Bioindicators possess a moderate tolerance to environmental changes, which allows them enough sensitivity to indicate changes, yet the endurance to withstand some variability. The requirements of a bioindicator include an ecology and life history that are well understood, an adequate local population density, and more importantly these days, an economic viability. If the species is too expensive or time-consuming to monitor and survey, a more suitable one will be sought out. For many of us, a water supply offers an excellent bioindicator of health. As a consequence, fish are held as possibly the most significant bioindicator species. If the fish are healthy, then almost everything else will follow. There are many examples. An interesting one is the cutthroat salmon that inhabit the cold water streams of the western United States. They have an upper thermal tolerance of between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. Now, Thermal pollution, as a result of human activities such as livestock grazing or logging, causes these salmon to produce more heat shock protein to protect vital cellular function. These protein levels can be quantified to measure the thermal stress on cutthroat salmon and assess how their environment has been altered. If thermal stress persists, it can lead to behavioral changes and subsequent reductions in growth and development, or, in extreme cases, to local extinctions. On a larger scale, communities of insects can also function as bioindicators. Termite colonies are affected by land use change and disturbance, and their response can be a strong indicator of environmental quality and change, such as termite biomass, their relative abundance, and even the proportion of soil-eating termites to wood-eating termites. Of course, forests are treasure troves of potential bioindicators. The many species and communities within a forest can indicate everything from air quality to trace element pollution to sustainable forest management. Every year, new species are proposed as potential bioindicators, plants for ambient ozone pollution, or ground-dwelling beetles and spiders for the disturbance impacts of renewable resource management. In Canada, management of our forests is a major economic and environmental activity. But the health of a forest can't be determined by observing a single species. Even a subset of a species can only respond to so many factors and responses. 
It is only by monitoring the different communities within a forest, the watershed, the soil, the bird or small mammal populations, and even the trees themselves, that can help paint a picture of the true health of the ecosystem. As we pointed out in an earlier video, a forest is far from being merely a source of lumber. And there is increasing amounts of research helping us understand and manage our forests. Perhaps we're coming full circle. The wisdom of North America's indigenous people is starting to be acknowledged as having a fundamental influence on the management of such local resources. So we'll end this video with a piece called My Place, written by Mr. Albert Dumont, an Algonquin elder who has given us permission to include this here. It comes from the book of Trees and Wisdom, and this piece is called My Place. I go to that solemn place for the purpose of peace and healing and to address my relatives in the spirit world. This remarkable sanctuary is a place where white birch, pine and spruce trees thrive in great numbers. But it is the cedars that are predominant and it is they I feel a kindred closeness to. These trees, fraught with wisdom and inspiration, stand on the shores of the Grand Lake, whose pure waters give substance to abundant life forms. A turtle visits, as do numerous frogs and minnows. A loon calls from the centre of the lake. Crows debate a plan from the treetops. A turkey vulture soars high among cirrus clouds. Robins, woodpeckers, kingfishers and many other winged beings contribute greatly to the beauty and tranquility of this healing place. Stones and moss-covered rocks crack with age surround the lake. A breeze causes ferns and grasses to push decaying leaves into small piles under which mice hide to escape the angry snake. I do not strike the mosquitoes and black fly that bite me when I visit there. I allow them to feed from me and in return I ask the spirit world to grant me the ability to endure life's true sufferings in a courageous way. It's my healing place and I would be miserable without it. The next video is about transition living. And we'll see you then. Mm -hmm.